morning, church family, and welcome to online worship for the first Sunday in Lent. One important announcement as we get started, as some of you have perhaps already seen in your weekly email, we will be returning to in-person worship starting with the first Sunday in March. So that's March 7th will be our first day having in-person worship here back in the sanctuary. I am so excited to be able to see all your faces again. I have missed you. But of course, what is most important is keeping all of you safe. So as we return to in-person in -person worship, please remember that we are continuing all of our COVID-19 safety protocols. So you must continue to wear a mask in the building. You will have your temperature checked as you come in. We must continue to physically distance. And of course, if you are feeling unwell at all, please stay home. For the time being, we will also continue to record live worship and post it on YouTube for those who do not yet feel quite ready to come back to in-person worship. We understand that and we love you. We will also have for our first Sunday back, as it's the first Sunday of a month, we will celebrate communion using the same self-serve style that we have been doing since COVID-19. One other announcement, since we are resuming in-person worship, we have also rescheduled the long-delayed congregational meeting. We are combining the budget meeting which we should have had in November, and the annual meeting, which we should have had in January, into a single meeting this year, which will be held on March 21st, with a snow date of the 28th. So those are your important days to keep in mind for the next few weeks. March 7th, communion and a return to in-person worship, and March 21st, our annual meeting. And now, with those exciting thoughts about coming back in your head, let us listen to the chimes and enter into worship. And now, friends, I invite you at home to join with me in our responsive call to worship. Your phrase to say aloud at home this morning is, God's promises are forever. So each time I gesture to you, say aloud with me the phrase, God's promises are forever. And together we will call each other to worship. Though the world turns and societies evolve, God's promises are forever. Though churches thrive and struggle, start with one plan only to turn to another, God's promises are forever. Though we change as we experience and question and learn our faith growing with us, 
God's promises are forever. And now, friends, I invite you to join in and sing along with our opening hymn, following the words on your screen. to God. Holy One, it is easy to feel alone when we are in the midst of a challenge. We convince ourselves that there is no one who can understand, no one who cares. We can't see a way out of our trouble. So we figure we may as well not even try. When we have lured ourselves into these false fears, remind us of the rainbow that assures us that there is always sun 
on the other side that you will never let us be destroyed. Forgive our faltering and help us reach out a hand that you may pull us through. And the people say, Amen. And now we also take a moment for our own personal confessions. You are never alone, even when you convince yourself that you are, God is there waiting for you to notice the divine love all around you. When you reach out, God will take your hand. Praise be to God. church family as we prepare to read our scriptures. Author of salvation, open our hearts as we open our ears, direct our spirits to find and learn from the message you have for us in the scriptures we are reading today. And the people say, Amen. Our first reading this morning recounts the end to the famous story of Noah's Ark. After the flood waters have gone down, God addresses Noah to reassure him that nothing like this ever happen again 
and to establish a covenant, a binding promise to that effect. We read from Genesis chapter 9, beginning at verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Here ends our first reading. During the season of Lent, we follow Jesus' ministry from beginning to end to a new beginning on Easter Sunday. So for our second reading, we return to the events that immediately precede Jesus' active ministry his baptism and his temptation, as recorded by the Gospel of Mark. We read from chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe in the good news. sends our readings for today. May their message strengthen our walk with Christ. Imagine Noah sheltering inside the ark with his family and the animals week after week as the rains come down longing for a breath of fresh air as he paces from end to end of the boat, the trip taking far too little time. 
Even caring for the animals doesn't take up enough of the day between the group of them. So there are long hours of nothing. Telling stories to each other, perhaps, but as the months draw on, their creativity wanes, and it ends up being the same stories told over and over. The boredom grates on all of them, not helped by the fact that they are eating the same handful of carefully rationed meals from their store of non-perishables. Hardly any surprise then if little things seem to start to seem like big things. If a suggestion to change the sleeping quarters leads to an all-out shouting match between the three sons and an offhand comment that perhaps the Ark was punishment for them after all causes Noah to stop speaking to his wife for days. By the time the waters recede, Noah and his family must all be well beyond their very last nerve. Imagine Jesus just starting to come into his own just beginning to consider the path he is destined to take when he is baptized. And then there's a dove and a voice with a weighty proclamation, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Well pleased. He hasn't even done anything yet. No pressure or anything. And right after this half compliment, half command, he is compelled to go out into the wilderness by himself with those heavy words and the expectation in them the last thing he hears before he leaves. So that is what fills his mind as his 40 days of solitude begins. Unlike Matthew and Luke, Mark doesn't give us any of the details of Jesus' temptation in his typical bare-bones fashion, Mark covers the baptism, the temptation, arrest of John the Baptist, and start of Jesus' ministry in six succinct verses. The temptation itself gets to But it wouldn't surprise me if Jesus' temptation started with his worry over the voice at his baptism. Well pleased, indeed. What if he can't live up to that? What if he can't go through with his destiny? Well, maybe he ought not to try. Maybe he ought to stay right here in the wilderness. If he never comes back, he can't disappoint anyone. Right? That's an easy hook for a tempting voice to latch onto as Jesus sits alone 
pondering who he is and the future he is meant for. But then, just as Noah thinks that maybe they won't survive this flood after all, Maybe his family will tear each other apart in sheer frustration at their forced quarantine. Then the waters recede enough that they can set their feet on dry land for the first time, and they've forgotten how long. They tumble happily out of the ark, gulping in the freedom and heading in different directions to explore this strange new world. That night when they converge back at the campsite, already much calmer for having had a few hours to themselves, the voice of God speaks to Noah and his family a promise never to put them or anyone else through such a flood again. Never, no matter what wrong we do, to so utterly forsake God's own creation. There is a better way to save us and God assures Noah of it with a rainbow in the sky. And the temptation crushes Jesus in exactly the opposite way. Out in the wilderness, he is so very alone. The only voice besides his own is the one of is that the voice of the one tempting him, wearing down his resistance. Far away from the encouragement of family or friends, it's a battle he can win only by himself as it stretches him thin and tired though. Angels come, reinforcements in the battle, helpers against the tempter, reminders of who he is, that he can indeed live up to the divine voice proclaiming itself well pleased. The angels come, and wait on Jesus, and he is not alone in the final stretch of his wilderness temptation. When God seals that first covenant with a rainbow in the sky, Noah could have scoffed too little too late. We've already had to spend a year cooped up on that ark. We already have to start our lives from scratch. He could have turned his back on the rainbow and the covenant. He could have rejected God. He and his sons could have stewed in the anger built up during the flood and lived the rest of their lives based on it, given up on righteousness in favor of benefiting themselves. Who needs a God who's come? Who needs a God whose promises come after suffering? Not them. I could have said. And when the angels come at the eleventh hour to wait on Jesus, he also could have scoffed. 
He's been suffering and striving for weeks, and the help that arrives as he's just about finished his temptation anyway is too little too late. He could have decided that the struggle isn't worth it and walked away from his destiny. No one would have dragged him to the cross. Living up to the expectation in the Divine Voices proclamation of well-pleased isn't that important after all, given the isolation and the temptation he had to go through before even starting to earn those words. He could have decided that. But he doesn't. Noah doesn't. Neither of them give up on God or on their calling. Noah hailed before the flood as one of the last righteous people, continues to follow God after the rainbow's promise. Despite the hardships of the months cooped up, he accepts the divine covenant and moves on from the ark mindset to work on building a more righteous world from his family will come Abraham, to whom is promised another covenant that the number of his descendants will rival the stars. And from Abraham will come the nation of Israel. Because Noah doesn't give up after the ark. After the temptation in the wilderness, Jesus goes straight into his ministry. He starts his journey to the cross by proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom come near and shows the people a better way to live. He does not give up on his destiny and he more than earns the Divine Voice's declaration of being well pleased with him. The empty tomb opens the door to a better way of saving the people. Just as God promised Noah so long ago, and the church is begun, because Jesus doesn't give up after his temptation. We all, we all have our arc seasons and our temptations. Certainly for some of us, periods of this pandemic may have been one or both forced into quarantine with our families by circumstances beyond our control. We may have found our tempers pushed to the limit, turning small arguments into big ones. Or maybe the pandemic has been a time of increased solitude where loneliness begins to grate on us and the tempting voices in our heads insist that there's no point in trying when things around us clearly aren't getting better. And the pandemic, though currently weighing on everyone, certainly isn't the first time that any of us have been pushed to our limit, where we do things we later regret because of the pressure we're under. 
we have been Noah and we've been Jesus. These stories show us that what we do in the midst of deep struggle, in the midst of impossible situations, is not what defines us. When circumstances are extreme, we don't have to be at our best. We don't have to beat ourselves up because we thought or did things that we regret. You don't have to be the best version of yourself when you are in the middle of your worst season. What matters is how we go on afterward, after the ark, after the wilderness. What matters is whether we give up on God because we have suffered or have faith in God's promises despite our suffering. What matters is whether we give up on God's call because we listened to the tempting voices during a dark time, or we commit to our calling despite our doubts. When the floodwaters recede and the angels arrive to help you back to your feet, those are the moments that define us. What you do after the flood and after the wilderness, that's what defines your faith journey. If you're in the middle of a tough spot, if you're surrounded by struggle, give yourself permission to relax for a moment. Give yourself permission to not be the best version of yourself. And then, and then focus on getting back up after. Focus on accepting God's promise and God's call after. Be the person who decides to keep the faith and keep going after the wilderness. Amen. Pray with me, church family. God of promises, creator of rainbows, you are with us even when the clouds darken and the storm rolls in. You are with us while we wait for the waters to recede, even if we are blinded by our own frustration. You're with us in the wilderness when the tempting voices insist otherwise. You are with us even when we feel alone, even when we start questioning if that tempting voice might be right. And you hear us. Now, as we pray to you, for those who are without power in the midst of extreme cold in Texas and elsewhere that winter's hand bears heavy, for those whose frustration with family or work or school threatens to overwhelm them, for those whose loneliness is wearing them down until they can't even reach out for help. For those who are suffering from illness, loss, rejection, or any other personal wilderness. Remind all of these and all of us, O oh God, that your
your promises are never broken. Your presence is never withdrawn. And that you will never give up on us. Help us in return to never give up on you. Your endless grace or the work to which you call us. We pray all of this as we pray the way you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Like Jesus coming out of the wilderness, we are committed to the work of God's kingdom. Remember that while we are separated physically, you can send whatever offering you choose to give to the church office or directly to our council president. During the offertory, Meditate on the places you have felt God's presence, where you least expected it. Christ, just as you did not give in to temptation in the wilderness, we also do not give up on making this world more like the one you preached, whatever the struggles. May our offerings be blessed as we use them for that purpose. And the people say, Amen. And the people at home can also sing 
So join along with the words on your screen for our closing hymn. into your week assured of God's promises and God's presence and with that assurance go in peace be strong and of good courage hold fast that which is good love and serve the Savior and may the blessing of God creator redeemer and sustainer Go with you and be with you always. Amen. Amen.